So Anita, so great to have you here to chat about your brand new book. Thank you for having me. Yes, I know. I've written a book. What? Um, yeah, very excited and nervous, but it's all good. I'll ride the nerves. <laughs> so it's called The Right Sort of Girl and it takes you through what well, takes the reader or listener through your childhood and through kind of growing up in your teen years. And one constant throughout <laughs> is food. <laughs> um, so talk me through what you know what food means to you and why food and connect human connection are so important together i love that that's the first theme that you picked up (laughs) i've done quite a lot of interviews and no one's asked me about the food brilliant holly yeah so this is um this is a story about how i've got to where i am i was thinking about this the other day it's almost like you know it's a cross section it's like a train journey going in in one it's like as the crow flies and i'm picking out little tidbits of basically telling you about my life including a bit of history but food is such a huge theme because it is a way that I connect to being Indian and it was it's such a huge part of my Punjabi culture it's part of a great huge part of lots of cultures but being Punjabi North Indian it is a way that my mother has shown her love my grandmother and you know I grew up eating curry on most nights lying to people that that's what I'd do like people at school be like I mean I don't even know thinking back it's such a strange question but you know children were curious at my school and somebody asked me what what do you eat on an evening and I just went sausage and chips which is not true I would have dal and roti and rice and delicious food every single night home cooked and no matter how long or busy my mother's day had been we would get fresh chapatis cooked for us every single night and it it's just really evocative and you know I wrote a lot about food about my grandmother and cooking and the recipes and even cooked whilst writing the book to create the smells and aroma uh, in my own home and now I find myself doing the same I really when I make Indian food it's so much more than taste and fuel it's really connecting with my ancestors (laughs) and who doesn't love a curry so you know it's true. Everyone loves everyone, a curry. <laughs> and that kind of notion of when you said you went into school and lied about what you had for dinner, that is also kind of a recurring theme of your childhood, trying to keep those two worlds separate, but also be the right part of you in the right place. And there's one story where you go out to an ice cream van in Indian clothing. What was the response you got from the other kids there? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, the, you know, this is a story about sort of navigating two worlds and I am sort of second generation. I'm the first to be born in this land. My Both my parents were born in India. And so I had to really, I mean, my dad was four when he came over. So, you know, he, he's, he's, a, he's a Yorkshireman. But really trying to figure out who I am and how I make my Indianness and my Britishness work and work to my advantage. And, and you, you learn very quickly, or I learned very quickly that, you know, certain things work in certain spaces and they don't in others. So the um, the ice cream story that I tell is on a Sunday we would go to the temple, we'd go to the Gudwara and that is a space where I would wear Indian clothes. Love wearing my Indian clothes and I'd come home on a Sunday and the first thing I would do is get changed into Western clothes and I would, because that was it. You know, I only wear Indian clothes in Indian environments. But the ice cream van had rocked up and as soon as you hear that music, it's like, I gotta have an ice cream. And, um, but I was like, oh my God, but I need to get changed. But I need to go and get an ice cream, but I need to get changed. And my mum and dad were like, just go, just go, you look lovely. So I went and I stood in the queue and it was a really hot day and there were loads of kids from my street queuing up. And one of the little girls said, looked at me, looked me up and down and said, we didn't know you were one of those. And that is, I think, we know what that means, basically. You know, she had basically, I was one thing when I was wearing Western clothes, and then as soon as I was in traditional dress, she just put me in another bracket. And it mortified me and it crushed me, and I was just humiliated and ashamed. And, you know, and it's something that's just so embedded in you, I suppose, when you, I think a lot of South Asian people listening to this, watching this, will relate to that that you just recognise that you dial down your ethnicity in certain spaces. And wearing Indian clothes at the ice cream van was not the done thing. (laughs) 
Although having said that, we came back from a wedding a few a couple of years ago and I walked down my street in a sari and got my husband to take pictures of me. It was like, just do it. I'm going to own my sari and my street and my country in my ethnic clothes. <laughs> I love that kind of owning it. And that is the kind of progression of, of this story is all about owning it. And there's one thing that you say in the book where you almost a couple of times had a nose job. And as someone sitting here with a larger nose who has also considered a nose job in the past, um, firstly, thank you because you're incredibly beautiful and you show other women that they are also incredibly beautiful. And secondly, how hard has it been to sort of not conform to those particularly Western yeah. beauty ideals? Completely Eurocentric beauty ideals. And I explore that because, you know, the, I, I talk about coming of age and I talk about what it means to be a young woman growing up. And if you grow up in a place where you just don't see any representations of beauty that reflect you, I mean, Never mind the shape of my nose, the colour of my skin was nowhere to be seen in the landscape, right? No magazines, not on TV, so no beautiful women were brown. And then add to that, living in, kind of growing up in 80s Britain, where, you know, it's like, oh, the Asian kid. No, I mean, I said it to my mate years ago, he's like, yeah, come on, everyone, no one fancied the Asian kid when we were growing up. But just, I think they did though, but secretly. No one openly fancied the Asian kid. So I talk about my nose, yeah, because, like, I have a proud Indian nose. But every time, I've, oh, my God, I've wanted to have it done so often. And what I recognise also is that it, it, it's always when my self-esteem is quite low. It's the first thing that jumps out at me. I find myself scrutinising the way I look. I don't know if you feel the same. Yeah. It's probably something that we all do. And it's like, well, that's... And I, I went to America to do an interview with... Dr. 90210, right? A massive Hollywood um, plastic surgeon who offered to do my nose. And so I came back and I spoke to my agent. I love that we're having a conversation. I've never had a conversation about my nose before, but I'm, in, I'm into it. I'm into it. Um, and he said, I'll do it for you. I'll fix your Indian nose. I was like, what? Like, who's going to fix your Indian nose, plastic surgeon? And my agent just said, don't do it. You'll be too pretty. I'm like, what does that mean? I want to be too pretty, which is kind of a weird thing yeah, to say in itself. Yeah, it's odd. Yeah, but my I'm so glad I didn't because you know what? It's that's not the answer. Like it's mm. just about becoming comfortable in the skin that you're in, and I'm really aware that as one as one of the few brown faces in the public eye. I mean, I know actresses left, right, and centre have work done, and Bollywood is also full of women who've had tweaks and tucks and all sorts. But for me, it just feels really important to represent the way I look as the way, you know, what, what message would it send out to other young yeah, South completely. Asian women? Um, if we're all conforming to this, and what are we conforming to? This bizarre standard of exactly. beauty and who set it? And, and also surely it's a fad. And it's also, you know, what am I doing? Am I, am I, am I that desperate to fit this ideal? Of, and it's, it's, it's a Western mm. way of looking. It's the rest of the world just doesn't look like that. Yeah. And another thing that comes from that kind of uh, cultural colonialism is is colorism, yeah. because it's all about being closer to whiteness. So how does that sort of appear in the Punjabi community? Oh my goodness, I'm, I had to talk about colorism. Colorism is this insidious. Oh, it just it's it just runs through South Asian culture, and not just South Asian culture. It runs through most cultures on the planet that aren't white, and it's not really fully understood by the wider community or white people. Um, people, I made a documentary about it years ago and um, people would be like, oh, well, it's just like us wanting to be tanned. And actually, no, it's really different. It's really different. This is about life chances, the life chances of someone being changed based on the color of their skin and particularly women. And ultimately for women, particularly in my culture, it's all to do with marriageability. So if you're a dark skinned girl, you are less attractive and if you're a light-skinned girl, you are beautiful. You'll go to weddings and there'll be aunties. I talk about the aunties in the book a lot, you know, and they'll say, oh, girl is pretty, but too dark, too dark. Or, you know, oh yes, such a fair, beautiful bride, and it's always weddings. Um, and, you know, these mad judgments are made mm. about skin colors, yeah. 
it's so lay multi-layered and complicated because that happens within our own culture so a fairer skinned child will be treated a certain way and you see it happening and I'd see it within my own extended family that a fair skinned child will just be told it's beautiful oh isn't she gorgeous and I'm right you recognize hang on maybe the like slightly darker skinned girl isn't getting the same attention which is heartbreaking and then you know we you, you live in Britain wider society it's the fair skinned girls that are the ones that are going to get the jobs that are going to be fancied I'm so done with it and over it and I feel like if I was going to write a book about my experience I had to call it out otherwise nothing will change and like what it's just like you know we're talking about this sort of cultural colonialism this Eurocentric view of beauty how it's so mad that we are so we are somebody has told us made us believe that the natural colour of our skin is incorrect. Yeah. It's, it's so crazy to get your head around that, isn't it? Yeah. And there's a whole m b billion dollar beauty industry that is pumping products out to us that don't work. Yeah. Um, to get us to change the colour of our skin, like the, looking in the mirror and just hating the colour of your skin, it's just it's so sad. Mm. And I think it, it does need to be talked about more because people, I think, understand the concept of racism. We hope they do. Um, colorism I think people are white people are still getting their heads around and need yeah. to understand it a lot more so yeah I think it was a, a really important part of the book in there yeah I mean the book is written for so many people right I wrote it for my younger self because there's just nowhere there's so many amazing coming of age books and memoirs out there but I remember thinking where where am I in the story where's my story and I thought well I should just write it right I should just write my experience so I'm writing it for everyone. I'm writing it for people who have never <laughs> encountered a Punjabi girl from Yorkshire. I mean, I'm on your telly, but you know, I come with a story. So, you know, just to, I'll bring you into a different world. I'm writing it for anyone who's felt like they've, they're on the outside, who's felt othered, um, or women, but I'm re but South Asian kids, right? Who just live an experience that is different. And Finally, very important question. What's your favourite Kate Bush song to sing out to? <gasps> out on the wily, windy moors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kate Bush, my God. What a woman. Uh, I mean, most of them, but Wuthering Heights. I mean... It's the classic. Uh, yeah. It's the classic. I mean, I'm on, I'm on the Yorkshire moors. I'm there. <laughs> and now you've sung that, that will be in everyone's head for the rest of the day. Heathcliff. I've even got a dance. We've all got a dance. <laughs> Listen, I've already, you know, pierced your ears with my uh, out of tune You're singing. You're good. <laughs> you I mean, she's a she's a legend. I mean, wow, 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 yeah. wow. Yeah, what a woman. <laughs> well, Anise, this has been such a pleasure to chat to you. Thank you so much. Holly, I love that. You're awesome. Thank you. And that shirt. Um, <laughs> if you see me next time walking down the street and I'm wearing this outfit, thank you. You've inspired me. <laughs>